The world is changing. People wonder what's going to happen next. There seems to be so much uncertainty. And who's got the answers? Politicians, businessmen, environmentalists, Hollywood celebrities? The Bible says your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Like the North Star, a trusted fixed point that can navigate your home in a sea of uncertainty. God wrote this book, the Bible. There are only two ways to approach the Bible. You either start with man or you start with God. And there is a world of difference between the two. A man-centered starting point imposes man's opinions and expectations and demands on the Bible. Man demands that God should act and speak and look like how we think he ought to act and speak and appear. Even though the opinions of man about God are prolific and are often mutually exclusive and contradictory. On the other hand, the God-centered starting point begins by simply accepting that God is God and we are not. The God-centered approach believes without reservation that God, as he is revealed in Scripture, is exactly who and what the Scriptures say he is. He is the almighty, sovereign, creator, sustainer of the universe. He holds the cosmos in his hands. He sits on his throne and he can do whatever he pleases. Everything God does is because he and he alone decides to do it. Because he wants to. Because it is his own perfect will. He needs no reason to do anything other than that he is pleased to do it. God is perfect holy and just. Therefore, everything he does is perfect, holy and just. Even when something he does seems to us to be unfair or when we simply don't understand or when he seems to be unjust, the God-centered starting point to the Bible accepts that we simply don't understand. The Bible says that we see through at last darkly. And so the, the God-centered starting point accepts that. But one day, we will see him face to face. Then we will understand everything. The God-centered approach believes that God wrote a book. Back before the foundation of the universe, before man was even created, God decided to share his thoughts with the human race. So he chose man, ordinary man, like us, to put pen to parchment and write down what he wanted us to know about him, about us, about the world, about where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, and how the story ends. God moved in the minds of these human authors putting truth through human personalities and inspired them to write the book. Forty authors wrote 66 books over 1500 years on three continents and three languages with one compelling theme and one victorious, magnificent and majestic hero from cover to cover. It's a story of a king and a kingdom and redemption through the shed blood of an innocent third party. This crimson thread of blood stitches together all 66 books, producing a humanly impossible unity of theme through the diversity of authors and books. That's an undisputed historical reality, and the book is real. It exists. You can read it for yourself. How could that happen if God didn't do it? And this book was perfect when the authors wrote those original autographs. It could be no other way. A perfect God would only write a perfect book. One error would make God imperfect. One error would make the book imperfect. One error with, would contaminate the whole as surely as one drop of hemlock would contaminate a water supply. Every word and every thought was true and perfect at every point 
in those first documents written with human hands and human minds and human personalities under the inspiration of a divine spirit. But this book was written for the ages and the nations. One document of each book wasn't enough. The supply far fell short of the demand. Copies were needed fast without the help of electronic print. So the originals were reproduced by mere men. Uh, scribes, men tasked with the holy responsibility of transcribing holy scripture. So they copied with the most supreme care the human mind and human hands were capable of. They were copied by the thousands because the demand was great for a book written by God. The originals, of course, are long lost, but many of those copies have been discovered in archaeological exploration that are thousands of years old and very close to the time that the original documents were written. Tens of thousands more copies than any other literature from antiquity. And amazingly, they're almost all, at every point, near carbon copies of each other. God went to the trouble of writing a book so it would make sense that he would then preserve the purity of the reproductions down through the centuries. A God-centered starting point to the Bible comes with certainty that the transcripts we have today and the Bible that we have today that originate from those texts is the perfect, inerrant word of the living God. A God-centered starting point accepts that when we come across something in this book that seems to be contradictory or that we don't understand or that doesn't fit our expectation of what we think God should be or something that seems to us unfair, then we accept that the Bible is not wrong. It's just that we don't rightly understand it. A God-centered starting point to the Bible bows the knee and surrender to the Bible and allows the scripture to judge the human heart. The Bible and Jesus are inseparable. You can't accept Jesus without accepting the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God and Jesus is the Word made flesh. God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. A man-centered starting point to the Bible, on the other hand, assaults the Bible with human opinions and human expectations. The Bible says that God made man in his own image. The man-centered approach to the Bible returns the favor and attempts to make God in man's image. A man-centered approach sits in judgment on the Bible, unaware that the Bible is judging him. A man-centered approach to the Bible demands that God should be a God who fits our criteria for God. It expects God to act in a way that is consistent with our definition of what is fair and unfair. The man-centered starting point makes up a God who fits their image of God. The man-centered approach rejects Jesus because he doesn't say or do the things we would say or do if we were Jesus. Fortunately, Jesus was like none of us because Jesus was no mere man. If God were the exact replication of our idea of what God should be like, he would be no God at all, for he would be a God conceived in the mind of man, made in the image of man. The man-centered approach to the Bible is never satisfied. Even if God behaved in a manner consistent with our expectations, he wouldn't be enough because there will always be another cynicism, another rebuttal, another excuse for not believing. For the man-centered approach to the Bible, the only thing that evidence proves is that some people won't believe no matter how much evidence is presented. The God of Scripture is unlike anything any man would ever conceive. Because the God of Scripture is God. If the God of the Bible 
acted and looked and spoke the way we would expect him to act and speak, that would be compelling evidence that the Bible is a man-written book. No man would ever conceive of a sovereign God who claims that man is small and unable to fully understand God and who cannot accept the truth of the Bible without the Spirit of God's supernatural illumination working in the human heart. Yet that's exactly what the Bible claims. No man would create a God who chooses or elects only some people to go to heaven and leave others behind, while at the same time holding the human race responsible to choose or reject Christ. Yet those are the claims the Bible makes. The sovereign electing choosing of God is an offense to those who consider the Bible from a man-centered approach. No man would design a God who describes the ugliness of sin in the human heart the way the Bible does and calls the human heart desperately wicked. No man would conceive of a God who would sentence the world to eternal death for the wages of sin and then send his son to die to pay that wage and then claim that the Son of God who hung on the cross is equal to God and in fact is God because that doesn't make any sense to the minds of mere mortals yet that's what the Bible claims. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity is a truth that lies way beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. Yet that's how the God of Scripture describes himself. Three persons in one, one in three, our triune God. No wonder God said, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. God said to Job one day, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? The only thing we can know is what God decides to reveal to us. Some people are offended by the Bible. Some ask, Will the Bible meet my needs? Some say they don't like the Bible. There's only one question that really matters as far as the Bible is concerned. Is it true? If it's not true, then we are, as the Apostle Paul said, of all men to be most pitied. But it is true. And we are not smarter than the Bible, and we cannot get rid of it. Many of its enemies have tried over the centuries, and they are gone, and the Word of God is still here. We simply need to bow low and worship the Christ of Scripture, and believe, and obey Him, and live a life that is pleasing to the One who wrote the book.